Well, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to another uh, edition of the RTI Speed Tips with Bob and Chad, episode number 48. Um, not too long, we're going to have episode number 50. Um, we got some big things that we're, ta we're talking about doing for that. So we want to let everybody know that we want your input. If there's some, some something special that you guys would like to see us do for the our 50th episode, we're we're open for suggestions. And and our next uh, our 49th episode is going to be December 6th. So uh, we we'll look forward to seeing everybody then. Um, so what's new and exciting at Weir's Machine? Man, it's been uh, super busy. We've been thrashing, working on the catalog, working on the new stuff, getting everything finalized, and them boys were working pretty hard to get the the truck and trailer ready to go. They're Austin and Billy, and and uh, they're them guys are out in Vegas. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make it. I had prior obligations with one of my buildings here. I got a new business opening uh, in one of my business buildings in town next to manufacturing. So. I feel I uh, felt obligated to stay here and make sure that everything went smooth with that build out and uh, got her up and running good there. So, but we've been busy. Uh, parts are shipping and things are happening. So, it's kind of the way it's been here. We've had a little bit of problem getting some some items, but uh, that's kind of where we're we're back to the old original show here, doing it in my office because. There's absolutely no room in the shop for anything additional to be put in there. And we were thinking about all the stuff we'd have to move to to get it all set up. And it was like, you know, I put the golf cart in the in the shock trailer and it still wasn't really enough room. And we decided, well, we'll just do it up here for this this month and, and this will be fine. Um, and once again, we've got our, our 2000... 22 schools all ready to go. We have January uh, 14th and 15th with our Sport Mod School. Um, the Four Link School is going to be uh, February 5th and 6th. Stock Car School is going to be the 25th and 26th. And then uh, our New York School, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio School is going to be March 4th and 5th out there, same place we were two years ago. So that's exciting. Uh, we're really looking forward to going back out there. Um, we released the. Uh, when did you do that today, Gary? Did you put or when did you put the school up? Friday. Friday. Well, we've got ten registered people already. We put it up on Friday, so sounds cool. like they're excited. So that's going to be pretty cool. Um, I'll go as long as you guys don't make me walk out on that bridge again. Yeah, I was thinking about that today too. I'm like whether or not we would need to go a complete day earlier if we can you know i'm gonna have to coordinate that with those people is if, if we can get in there like we did before but yeah that was a long bridge man that baby stuck out there quite a ways and and that stand on that glass piece where you could look straight down that was a little spooky catch it was that was a long, long way down. What was it, 300 feet? Uh, 300 rings a bell, yeah. I was thinking, I don't know. It was, I mean, there was a, I remember watching, there was a guy with his dog out there, and it looked like a couple ants. Yeah. Down there where they were uh, walking below that bridge. I'm thinking, wow, that baby was cool. Can you imagine those people build that build, uh, build that did build that thing? That had to be unreal. But anyway, so so hi, Corey and Tim. Uh, we got Richards uh, in here. Um, Aaron Sowers, thanks for the chance to win the school back. Can't wait to come back in February. So we're looking forward to it. Really looking forward to the schools. I actually, that's what might have been my mission here the last two weeks is working on the, the books themselves. So I'm actually ahead of the game. Um, of course, there'll probably be some stuff I want to change at the last minute, but if there's anything that you think that we need to add, make sure and let me know, Chad. Um, question. Joey's got a question. Do you sell bare chassis? If so, how much are they? Um, actually, Joey, the way we've got to work it, because 
we buy them right from GRT. And so the chassis margin, profit margin is not super strong. So the only way we can actually sell it is with a frame body and interior all powder coated and all together. And then with the front suspension on it, which that way would make sure that the car is good to go. And we would consider selling one in, in that kind of a, a box kit type format. Um, you just have to call and, and talk to one of the sales guys about an actual price because I couldn't actually tell you what off the top of my head. What's the hardest thing to get right on a slick over racetrack? Well, the, what actually ends up happening majority of the time, and, I, and people have done this, and I've done it for years, is you tend to over-tighten the car on a slick racetrack. What happens is, is you tighten the car up so much, then the car gets to the point where you roll in, get going in through phase one, the car kind of has to break traction just a little bit, and with a slick racetrack, that's the thing, if, if you can at all possibly help it not to break traction and let the car roll on its own so you can ease up off the throttle getting on. That's probably the biggest thing that I see that's the hardest to get right is people will go, oh, gosh, we got to take all the stagger out of it. We got to do all this and we got to put lead in it and all that, which that's all fine and dandy for a corner exit. But it can can really hurt you, you know, phase one and phase two of the corner. And then what happens is if you lose if you lose phase one and phase two, I, I don't really care how good the car is coming off the corner. You're 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 already a, a car length behind. Good evening, guys. On a northern sport mod, how much spring is too much spring in the right rear? Currently running a 225, but I still feel like it rolls over too much on the right rear has over four inches of shock travel on the shock indicator. Well, and one thing about always remind, I, I can't stress the fact enough, the, uh, the, the shock travel indicator on the shock absorber. Sometimes that might be a deal where it might hit that four inch mark where you come up over the hump and go on the racetrack. You actually got to really look at the actual dust ring on the shaft to see what your movement is. But in answer to your original question, um, you know, we've got some guys on some northern sport mods that are running 250 right rears. Um, in certain situations, I think that works pretty good. Um, it really helps the car snug itself up getting into the corner. Um, works pretty decent in the middle of the corner, kind of holds the car up. Biggest thing is, is when it does get slick, sometimes it can it can hurt the forward traction off the corner but what you're hoping that you'll do is you'll pick up momentum and with the momentum you know that you're going 10 mile an hour faster up off the corner so that looseness isn't an issue so 250 i've not on a sport mod i've not experimented with anything more than a 250. Uh, i'm not saying it can't be done i just i've just not done it uh, will the CRS upper BHE cells fit a 17A mod? We can actually get one that fits the 17A mod. Uh, if you order them from us, make sure you specify what it's actual for. And we probably actually have that one in stock because we do have some built for the uh, 2016, 17, 18, 19 cars. Uh, before they, well, actually, I think it was 18 was, 19 was when they first started making the new style car, or 20, I don't remember which one it was. But anyway, one of those two. But we've got those on hand, so that's not a problem. Uh, it's the same style, a little, just a little different configuration, but it's the same style. Switching from the standard index cage over to the zero index cage, do you still recommend indexing into the spring around one degree or so at right height? Um, I actually index it six degrees is what we actually do here. What what are you th what's your, your thoughts, Chad? I would say one to three, but you know, I mean if you're six into the spring, that's if that's where you want to be, that's where you want to be. So 
I think it's just consistency. Uh, you know, once you switch to zero index, you have to you have to commit. I feel there's so many guys that put it on there and and then they don't focus on on rebalancing the race car around it and and seeing the true advantage to it. So I would say just start somewhere and stick to it and adjust accordingly and and don't uh, don't panic right out of the box. It's going to take some fine tuning to get it dialed in. Yeah, the zero indexing, the whole concept is really good it's just that's like chad just said a lot of problems sometimes people don't understand that there's a little bit more to it than that and you've got to get the whole car balanced around that zero indexing when you get that done it's it's spot on man i mean it, it it's it, it works very 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 well uh tim says he's got an idea for chad for a part I messaged you. I messaged your page a few days ago. Hopefully, they told you about it. So I'm sure that's on my desk with uh, everything else. I've been the last three, four days. I've been running around like a chicken with his head cut off, trying to get this build out going for this business that's moving into one of my buildings. So I've been a little preoccupied elsewhere, uh, trying to get that handled and and dialed in. So I'm sure that Nicole's got a stack of stuff that she's been waiting to go over with me. So. I will see that soon, and we will be in touch, sir. Um, Cody's got, what's the difference between a B&B &B and a B&B &B by BHE? What do you change? Um, biggest thing is there's really no major changes on the car at, at this point. Um, we're looking at down the road, uh, maybe some of the stuff in the front end maybe can be tweaked a little bit, but... Uh, right now, the, it's just, you know, we're just assembling them cars here, and uh, we assemble it just a little bit differently. There's just a few little knickknacks on the car that we do a little different. But as far as performance, I'd be lying to you if I was telling you that, it, you know, that car is going to outperform a standard BNB. Um, we're just kind of new into the stock car thing and, and just kind of, going at it this year more of as, as a research and development program to see you know if that's a direction that we want to go and, and what the response from the stock car people is by doing it you know doing your stuff with us and the thing is is we're to the point where we're so busy with modified stuff right now that we've kind of limited our stock car deal to five cars this year we've already done one and uh I just don't know. We, we've got more help than we've had, but right now we just uh, we're just running out of room. We got to get some stuff done, and and last thing I want to do is try to come in here and reinvent a whole new project without doing a, a year worth of testing and doing some research and development with it. So that's the the true story behind what we do here at BG with the BMB. Paul builds a good race car. Uh, you know, like I said, we our shock package is a little different. There's just some few things that we do different that way. But other than that, that's basically it. I know you guys aren't UMP up there, but what, what do you and Chad think about the rule changes? Boy, Jim, I hate to tell you, I've not. I've not actually been made aware of. Have you been made aware of some rule changes, Chad? Yeah, uh, you know I'm pretty close to uh, a bunch of them UMP guys, and you know they made they made some rule changes to you know I mean for instance Nick Hoffman got thrown out with no brake line to the right front caliper, which that was the big the big hoopla or whatever. Well, I mean it, to me it's kind of dumb. It says right in there you can run a shut off. So if you got to shut off all the time, what's the point of putting the line on? Well, now you have to run the line. They all have to lock up. I mean, I get that. Whatever. Fine. It's not going to stop him from winning. Uh, the body stuff is they're trying to just make their jobs easier and get a you know more of a baseline package, I believe. But uh, the wheelbase thing is the one that I just kind of sat there and went like, what? <laughs> the same on both sides, plus or minus a half inch, no tolerance? I mean... Wow. So that's that was the one that blew my mind. And then they already amended the fuel cell one, I think. There was they were gonna increase it to must be a twenty-two gallon cell or something. Let's let's carry more bomb on board when we're running twenty-five lap races 
you know, if you only use seven, eight gallons or whatever, why have 22? So some of the stuff you kind of look at and read it and you shake your head at it. And the wheelbase thing is clearly, I mean, that was mind boggling. Like, I don't know if that, I mean, you got to understand what these cars take to go around the racetrack. Sometimes the wheelbase is statically, what, inch, inch and a quarter of trail, you know, on some of them. So, but I mean, it, it, well, it is what it is. Well, with the turn stub on it, it's going to be yeah, five they're all illegal. Five eighths of an inch square out of the box. Right. So clearly that one was, I hope they amend that one, but I mean, whatever. It's, you know, there's all a lot of hoopla about it, but. Winners are still going to win, man. So it is what it is. A couple of them changes were pointed at one individual. And I mean, he's already been in the wind tunnel with a new body. So you winners win. You can't beat them guys. So. Yeah. Unless you put the same effort into it. Lots of effort there. I mean, lots of effort, you know, wind tunnel time, all that kind of stuff. I mean, anyway, um, Mike, uh, where do you recommend for the motor to be mounted center of the frame, left to right, and right of center? Actually, on a sport mod and a modified, we locate the motor dead center um, between the two frame rails. So it's equally centered between the two front wheels, basically. And then uh, I'd have to actually look in my book, but to me, I was thinking that the crate motors we mount those 13 inches above ground level to the center of the crankshaft um don't hold me that it could be 12 but i'm pretty sure that the standard motors the open motors were 12 and the crate motors were uh, 13 to the center of the crankshaft so dead center 13 inches above the ground hey Bob. I won one of your all's cars off of a raffle and we're fighting a lack side bite and drive off. What would you suggest? We race in Georgia where it's dusty clay and gets, or where it's red clay and gets very dusty. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can do, you know, a little bit more panard bar angle to kind of help that side bite a little bit. Um, you know, you could go with moving the rear end slightly to, you know, depending on what you have for wheel offsets, you know, you could run, uh, uh, move the rear end to the left just a little bit, uh, drive off. One thing about we shorten the wheelbase on the right side or lengthen the wheelbase on the left side. And I had a, an interesting conversation from, a, a, a Bob and Chad question on the phone today and, and he was talking about the fact that he had bought your new software for the, the four link software and the way he was measuring his car and the way the software measured it he was getting three inches of uh, roll steer with the software and four inches um, by the way he was measuring the car well, we finally figured out how he was measuring the car compared to how the software measures it. So we got that all squared away. But the point being is I, I explained it to him. You know, you got to limit your steer. You got to limit it a little bit with the chain. But still, you might have to run some static lead in the car to compensate for the amount of steer that the car gets through the middle of the corner and up off the corner. So there, that would be the two things that I would uh, look at there is just, you know, controlling some steer. Go ahead, Chad. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty spot on. The The software also is a, you know, it's, it's a good tool. Uh, it's two dimensional, so it's not gonna be, it's not ever gonna be exactly what you see on the race car, but it's it's to help you learn what changes do and how they affect it. Well, and that's kind of what I explained it to the guy today that I said, it, you know, there's 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 going to be certain portions of it that are going to measure a little different on on the on the actual car. But the concept is going to show you if I change this bar from a 14 inch bar to a 15 inch bar, what it's actually going to do and go. it's going to show you the timing of that aspect and everything. And so he was. He was very excited and, and was really thrilled about working with it. And, and like I said, we just, he was just confused for a split second there. And I explained it to him that 
the, the difference of how you're measuring it in a static situation or dynamic situation on the car compared to the software is probably going to be a little bit different, but it's the concept. Does raising the left rear lower bar on an A mod put more drive in to that tire as well? What are some of the good setup tips on high bank bull rings? That's all we have out here in California. I appreciate both of you for your during the show and you've helped me a ton. Go ahead, Chad. What do you think about that one? I assume he's talking about raising it on the frame. Yeah. Left, left lower bar. So, I mean, that's going to give you drive angle, which is going to give you traction, but it's also going to give you steer. So it's going to free you up in into the middle and give you more drive off. The question is if, the roll steer is going to make you too bent so you can't square up then you're going to be you're going to be sideways so that the left bottom bar is real touchy as far as you know giving you traction versus getting you too free in the middle of the corner so you never get squared back up to go straight off the corner with the traction so it's kind of a balancing act there on that left bottom rod but definitely up on the frame is more traction more drive angle yeah it'll definitely give you more straight straight line traction um, the downside to it, like Chad just explained, and I'm just going to reiterate it a little bit, is the additional steer that it puts into it. It might not, the steer it puts into it where it's going to have that steer might not be advantageous. I don't run a tremendous amount of angle in that left lower bar just because of that factor. Um, you know, your two upper bars are your traction bars and your two lower bars are your steer bars. So you kind of, you know, not saying that the lower bar doesn't have traction, but it has more uh, to do with the, uh, it's more of a steer in that aspect. That might be one thing, you know, a little bit more, just one more thing on that is the, if you, if you figure out your max steer on your baseline package, two and a half inches or whatnot, and then you say, okay, I'm at two and a half inches and you want to raise that bar, raise that bar stop you know and then see let, if it goes two and three quarter or, or three roll steer it back and that's exactly. what bob was talking about a little bit ago with putting that trail in that left rear so that your final steer location is where you were with your other package if you can balance that roll steer and have more drive angle then theoretically best of both worlds yeah, yeah. And, and that's the big thing is a lot of people don't understand that those two concepts need to kind of work together uh, when it puts more steer in it, you got to take that steer out of there statically so that uh, it runs the car straight. Is there a real advantage to electric weld tubing versus DOM cars? Um, well, I know there was a chassis builder that built a lot of great late models back in these days that were all electric weld tubing. Myself, I, I've always been DOM or Molly. Uh, our cars that we build here, the front half of the car is Molly tubing, and the rest of the car is all DOM. Um, I think the electric weld, it's just like if you take a piece of tubing, say, for example, we, we take a piece of tubing and we bend it in the, in the, in the bender to a 45-degree angle. A piece of DOM or a piece of electric weld probably will spring back to maybe mm, 42 degrees instead of 45. A piece of DOM will spring back to maybe 40, 38 degrees. A piece of Molly has more memory to the point where it might actually be in that 38, 36 degrees. So it takes a lot more original bend to get your mile or get your 45 degrees. So by knowing that, that just tells you in that constant bending motion where the car is constantly flexing, the electric weld car is eventually going to crack easier. And it's just, you know, the, the tubing is just not, uh, you know, it's just not designed. It, it works great for bumpers and things like that that are immaterial, but I, I don't like it on a, on a race car itself. Uh, Corey says, I watched your video on trail braking. On a scale, how important or good or unimportant is this style of on-off throttle control? Well, Especially on a drill, a dry slick racetrack, you're going to find that, that that method there actually can be pretty advantageous. 
a lot of the guys that are really good on the slick stuff are really good with trail braking and keeping the keeping the car hooked up between the brake and the throttle together because what happens is when you're when you're doing the trail braking and if you're doing it in a smooth fashion like what we kind of explained in that video what it'll actually do is it keeps the suspension loaded so when you get off the throttle and you're already on the brake before you get off the throttle the suspension won't fall down it keeps the car up on the bars and keeps the car in line so the car doesn't have to settle then try to hook back up and it works pretty well in that situation imca sport mod what does changing the angle on the pull bar do what does raising or lowering the whole bar at both ends vir virtually do um, changing the angle will definitely you know, more angle will get you quicker traction but doesn't last as long uh, less angle might not be quite as instant of traction but it'll last longer and you have more straightaway speed and more straightaway traction with, with a solid bar on the sport mod with it being higher or lower i don't know if it makes a tremendous amount of difference the higher you get it the less responsive it is the lower or closer to the rear end it's, it's a little bit more responsive so with that being something that's a solid link i'm not completely convinced it would make a tremendous amount of difference if you lowered the whole bar up or raised the whole bar up or lowered the whole pull bar angle is the key 15 degrees to 18 degrees angle is, is pretty standard um, you know shorter pull bars need a little bit more angle but the problem with it is unless you're on a real short racetrack your traction comes in quickly but it goes away fast too so like on a half mile racetrack where you've got a lot of momentum uh, 15 degree bar in fact we had guys this year were running 10 degrees uh, pretty flat um greg what's your recommendation on a right front softer shock or spring or both right front shock snaps the shaft it started turning better when it snapped the shaft well depending on the compression of the shock keep in mind a shock absorber is a timing device so what it does is it regulates the timing and, and you can either increase the timing by a soft valving or you can uh, decrease the timing by a stiffer valving so it kind of depends on what stiffness is the spring actually regulates how much actual movement and a lot of times what a guy will do is run a softer spring with a little bit stiffer shock so that the spring gets you the movement but it gets you down into the corner a little bit further so in your situation where it snapped the shaft on the shock and the car got better would lead me to believe that the car probably wouldn't mind a little softer compression shock absorber um, we've built them all over the board just depending on the, on the, the setup that the guy wants but um, that's what i would say if the shocks if it snapped that shaft and it started turning better that's just saying that it's getting on the right front faster than it was with the shock in full function when you're running the swift th spring on the right rear of a sport mod do you make a shock adjustment as well i've also seen some local cars running this spring on the left rear why would you anyone do this well I can't actually answer the question why they would do it on the left rear at all. Um, that, that spring has, there's a lot of good things to that spring, and then there's a lot of things about it that make that spring a little um, sensitive. So I think the shock absorber probably would be a little bit more crucial. Um, but I don't really have a tremendous amount of knowledge to back it up because we've not experimented with that spring on the right rear of a sport mod. Um, I know the stock car guys, a lot of stock car guys run that 
spring. And with that being said, on the stock car guys that run that spring, we've not done anything different on the shock absorber. So I can't completely answer your question. I apologize that. I just don't have enough knowledge working with that particular spring. Well, Pat says the Weirs boys are making you look good in, in Vegas. That's good. I miss you, Pat. I wish I was there. Um, on the Penn, Ohio type stock car, what areas would you look at to improve the car's ability to turn in phase one and phase two? Eric, that's a long question. Um, biggest thing I would do is just making sure that, you know, the a little softer right front spring to get the car into phase two, one and two better. Um, like we talked about with the shock just a little bit ago, maybe a softer spring, stiffer shock might work good. Um, it kind of depends on what what the problem is that you're having, if, if the car is too tight or if the car is too loose. So uh, feel free to add to that on when you say what areas would we look to, what do you, where do you think it needs to be improved and, and how does it need to be improved? And maybe I can help you a little bit more. So, well, once again, episode 48, uh, remind everybody that we've got the 2022 schools all online. So that the tickets can be sold online. They're available at the racetechinfo.com. Uh, sport mod class, once again, is January 14th and 15th. The two-link class, I mean. The four-link class is February 5th and 6th. Uh, our stock car class is uh, the 25th and 26th of February. And our uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York school is going to be March 5th and 4th and 5th. Um, remind everybody, we've got some Black Friday specials coming up. We're going to start promoting those here coming up this next week. And uh, so look forward to those. Those will be on Facebook. Uh, okay, Eric says, the car is too tight on entry. Uh, if the car is too tight on entry, then my next question is going to be, does the car roll to the right rear a lot? There's a big difference between the fact if the car is too tight on corner entry, it can be just too stiff of a spring, too stiff of a shock. If it's getting into the corner and rolling quite a bit, making it tight, then that leads me to believe that we're getting just too much roll on the right rear and we need to free the car up a little bit on the rear of the car. Uh, you know, maybe try to run a stiffer right rear spring uh, just to keep the car so it doesn't get quite so much side bite. Um, you know, that's a four link, uh, an OEM type four link car. Um, you can adjust the, um, you, you can raise your right lower arm up and put a little bit more angle in it. That might be a good thing to look at. So that would be some of the things I would look at. Out of curiosity, for the Sport Mod tooling class, do you guys have a class limit on the amount of people that can attend? Yeah, our actual limit on that is 65 people. Actually, I'd like to limit it to 60 because we've put 75 people in here before, but I won't do that with the COVID restrictions that, or I mean, the whatever the guidelines that people want us to kind of go by. Uh, that our, our place is just not big enough. 60 people is really the that's that's really pushing the limit there. And right now, I think that particular class, if I'm not mistaken, has got about 15, 15, 15 to 20 guys already entered. So that, that class is actually, well, all the classes have actually started to get, get traction, which is earlier than what it normally has. So if you're thinking about it, um, I'd probably definitely, uh, you know, and if for some reason or another you decide you come and you can't come at the last minute or whatever, you know, don't worry about that. We will refund your money. That's not an issue. So. Okay. Uh, air pressure, slick track, heavy track. How much does it affect the car? Sorry, boys, learning a lot. Um, air pressure is actually a pretty 
pretty good adjustment. Um, you know, you, you you watch these races on TV on Sunday, and those guys adjust their air pressures on those cars a pound or whatever. And believe it or not, in the dirt racing, a couple pounds in an air pressure chair, an air pressure is can be a big, pretty big deal. And so, you know, that being said, um, you know, if you want the car to get freer on a heavy racetrack, I tend to put more air in my right side tires, especially my right rear. Uh, that seems to make the car actually turn a little better. I might actually let a couple, a pound or so out of my left. I don't. The left side, you know, you're down 10 or 12 pounds, so you can't really go a lot lower than that with this particular tire. But the right rear, normally we would run, you know, in the neighborhood of 15, 16 pounds. Uh, I'd probably up that maybe even to 18 pounds or whatever on a real heavy type racetrack, and it will definitely make the car not have quite so much side bite. So it's definitely an advantage. Slick racetracks. If, if you're talking about the IMCA tire, you got to really be careful not to deflate that tire too much because what happens is when you deflate that tire, the sidewalls are so stiff that the tire will actually buckle in the middle. And what will happen is, is it will actually roll over and the second tread will actually stick out more to the point where you actually have less tread. It's not like a drag tire. You actually have less tread on the surface than you do with the correct amount of air pressure. Uh, Billy, hello, Bob and Chad. Enjoying listening to you guys. Uh, he wants to invite us both to this January 8th swap meet in Des Moines. Uh, I'd love to have you guys there. Thank you. Um, well, we'll look at the schedule and stuff and see kind of what's going on that weekend. Uh, that's the weekend before the school, so... I don't really know what. That's a long time ahead for me to be thinking. I'm I'm still working on tomorrow, man. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> that's a lot of thought involved. But I'll think about it, really. Um, so on Eric's question, mine doesn't roll enough. So soften in the right rear spring. Um, if you're not getting enough roll on your car, I would contemplate softening both right side, you know, right front and right rear. The, the downside, if you soften the right rear too much, what's going to happen is, it's the old adage, you always got to remember, the stiffer spring gets the weight. So you'd almost might be better off to move some static lead further to the right side to get the car to roll over on your right rear because when we soften the spring we'll get body roll but we won't necessarily get weight transfer so by changing and putting you know putting some moving some static weight or or moving your rear end slightly of course you guys with your suspension it's hard to actually move the rear end too too much to the left or whatever but you can move the rear end a half an inch to the left I don't think that would get it too out of line for you. That would definitely help tighten the car up getting in. Um, maybe, you know, if you're running three-inch offsets, taking try a four-inch wheel with a half-inch spacer so you, you're sucking that right rear in a half an inch would be a, a good thought to do. Um, but before I soften that spring, I would try moving some static, you know, weight somewhere in the car and try that first. Okay, sounds good. I appreciate it. Response, looking forward to seeing you guys, learning from you guys at the class. Yeah, G60. I thought, Corey, I was pretty sure that you were a G60. That's the thing. You just got to be careful. If you go too low on air on that left rear, when I see those guys got that left rear and it looks like it's a drag car because it's about half flat, uh, it's a big mistake on their part because what happens is, is that tire, the tire, the the sidewall is not designed to try to flex that much and it ends up buckling the cords on the tire and you lose, you actually lose traction rather than gain traction. But so you got, you got, you got your, your two best comrades in Vegas, huh? Scary. One's <laughs> never been there. Billy's never been to Vegas. So 
<clears throat> I told them that it's really not as much fun as everybody thinks it is. You know, I mean, you, you get to go on the road and, and service the customers and, and be in Las Vegas, but I mean, you got to go to the racetrack at 11 o'clock in the morning and you're there till one in the morning. So there's not a whole lot of time to, to goof off and get in trouble. So hopefully they, they stay out of trouble, but they should do a good job representing their, our product and our team there. And I'm quite sure they will. I don't know how many cars are there. I talked to him briefly, but uh, Austin's phone's acting up, so I couldn't stand to talk to him anymore because it was making a weird noise in my ears. So, but I haven't heard. Have you heard anything on car count or how? how it's no, looking? I haven't heard a thing. I've seen a picture of Ricky Thornton's late model there. So, Tim says we'll all goof off for you, Chad. Awesome. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know the last time I was down there, my fun of Vegas was getting back to the hotel, walking through the casino to say that I actually did it and seeing the casino and going up to my room. And then the same thing, like I said, before you know it, the sun's up, you get down and you have breakfast because you want to at least have one really good meal for the day. So you start off with a good breakfast. And then before you know it, it's time to go back to the racetrack and you stop and maybe get gas at a local gas station and get a couple of Pepsis or something for, for the time being or whatever. And that's, that's pretty much the extent of Vegas that you actually really get to see. The, I mean, you get to see the lights and everything. I mean, because you're, you're coming back into town at wee hours of the morning. I finally bought one of Chad's load sticks. I am seeing modified with an open motor four link. What would you be, what would be a, some good compressed load numbers to shoot for for a slick track? I'll let you take that one, Chad. Yeah, I mean, really, uh, I don't have any numbers. Uh, chassis builders stopped giving me data because I talked to too many people, but I don't know what you got for a. Uh, for a chassis uh i what i tell people and what we tell people in the school is you know it's about your notebook it's about your race car it's about comparing uh, another race car of a brand than whatever you have so uh, just because you know joe blow has 1250 pounds on his right front doesn't mean that 1250 is going to work for you because the shock mount location is so critical when you're using that load stick that if you're off by a half inch, that number could vary 50 pounds. Well, that's that's night and day. So the biggest thing is to start off with your car, get some good shock travel numbers, you know, go go to the racetrack. Well, let me back up for a second. Start out with your scaled ride heights and then put the stick on and get that center to center load number, you know, at your scaled ride height and, and document that. Then you want to go to the speedway and get some good shock travel numbers and that doesn't mean push the rubber up. The rubber is going to get, you know, over traveled in a bump or pulling on the track. Take some Sharpie, mark the shock shaft up or, or look at the dust ring on the shock shaft and actually get a good. When you come back in, then have your homeboys push down on the car and to the dust ring or where the Sharpies worn off. Get that center to center. Then you put the stick on the car, pull it to that down number, and then you document that. So. It's about all that tool is, is giving you data so that you know why when you go to a racetrack and you win the feature, you put that load stick on there and get that number for whatever that track is, whatever that condition is that night. You know, that's how you're going to get better and learn how to win races with that stick is, is analyzing each race, each race night. You know, if it is the same brand car, your chassis builder might have some numbers to go off of. But it's about you building that data for each racetrack and, and knowing what you need to be. When you go there, you know, if it's dry slick one night and you had 1,250 pounds and you won the feature, I want to know that six months from now. I want that in the notebook so I can replay that in my memory and go back and say, well, we're terrible tonight. And you put the stick on and you're at 1,150. Well, you're 100 pounds off from where you were the night you won. So the the load stick is, is uh, you know, you can't just hear that Ricky Thornton's got 1,250 pounds and put it on your car and win a race, you know. It's about your notebook and staying in your notebook and, and learning your race car. What you need to win races is, is what the load stick is helping you do. Well, I agree 100% with that one. You know, I couldn't, can't think of anything to add. Hobby stock. Car feels great and I can run down and catch the cars in front of me. 
and have the fastest lap time according to the to the race pass i especially noticed i can catch cars on the front of me going into the middle of the corner but cannot find forward bite on the, to make the pass is the car too tight and spinning the tires um this is during a heat race well alex there's a pretty good chance that you might find that if you you might be actually overdriving the car getting into the corner and that's why you're catching them because they're actually checking up and then they're letting their car settle in to the point where by the center of the corner it's ready to go forward your car might be to the point where it's going in so hard that um, you're upsetting the car getting the car rolled over on the right rear and then there's no load left on the left rear to 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 try and get you up off the corner i would try backing my corner up a car length or so and, and let the car more momentum rather than charging the corner quite so hard uh i like the sharpie idea it totally makes sense um yeah, that's one of the things that we learned that years ago. You take some thinner with you, and everybody's got a little bit of lacquer thinner for cleaning parts or whatever, or brake clean or whatever your case would be. Wipe that shaft down good and then just color that baby with that Sharpie. And and you can see, you, you'd be surprised that the, the Sharpie, you'll see the fade to the point where where it's running and where it's not been running so it works good and that like i said and chad said i mean it's you, you kind of there's no not a necessarily magical number unless your chassis builder's got a magic number but it, it what it works the best for is for tuning your car and learning what you can do with it and, and it's uh, it's an amazing tool uh, i i would i would hate to go to the racetrack without one yeah, like you said, watch your own bobber. I completely agree with that. Uh, makes complete sense. Thanks, you guys. Look forward to using the tool in the season. Well, we're up on getting close to that eight o'clock time. We've got some a few more questions. If you've got, or we've got some time for a few more questions. Um, the off season's coming up soon, and we know we've got guys down there racing in Vegas this weekend. And, and then pretty much every, everything's pretty well almost done after Vegas. And then it'll be time to do your off-season maintenance. And uh, what I'll do, I'll just actually go through. I've made a checklist here for off-season maintenance. One of the things that, uh, and I kind of grouped it into different categories, but one of the things is take your, you know, when you, you get done with the season, take your car completely apart and inspect the frame completely. Make sure that there's nothing bent. Uh, refer to your preseason measurements. Uh, check for all the welding and all the tubing so there's no cracks, uh, no cracks in the cage, the center down there by the X in case you lost the drive shaft or something like that. Motor mounts are another good place to check. There's a lot of torque in the motor, so a lot of times they'll work they'll get cracks in them and bars will crack uh, fuel cell brackets pan air bar mounts pull bar mounts boy check that stuff over very carefully because now is the time to actually be able to do it uh, when you've got time suspension check over your spindles your ball joints your control arms your hinds your tie rods just go over all that stuff because this is the time you know, where you've got more time now than you've got money and go through all that stuff and check and and regrease the zerks if needed uh, replace the zerks a, a lot of guys replace put new zerks in the car and um, so that you can get everything greased like you're supposed to check your sliders for any dents or dings in the shaft the sliders should be rebuilt every off season for sure always check your springs to make sure your springs have not got a natural bow in them from where the way they're running I actually recommend replacing springs every season. Um, they're not that expensive, and uh, then you have a new fresh start that you can go with. Shocks, carefully inspect the shocks. Same thing as you would do with your slider. Make sure there's no dents or no, no shaft nicks. Also check the hinds for movement. It's recommended to have your shocks rebuilt and refreshed every year off the season, every off season. Now, if you just did that, 
then the thing is, is make sure that you store these things correctly because the shocks need to be stored in a climate controlled environment where the temperature is, is controlled. Um, clean the clean around the shafts, make sure you take like a small, an old toothbrush and, and clean it with soapy water to make sure that there's no dirt that can kind of lay in there and corrode anything whatsoever. Uh, one more question we got here. What does mounting the pull bar behind the center line do to the car? IMCA Sport Mod. I don't really know if it's going to make a tremendous amount of difference with the Sport Mod car being a solid upper bar. Mounting the, the bar behind will actually allow the car, when you get roll steer, because you, you, you're, you're thinking that you won't get a lot of movement, but you do get a lot of movement back there. It will take angle out of the bar. So when your right rear, when your right rear goes down and your left rear goes up and the car is trying to launch itself up on that left rear, the bar can actually lose a little bit of angle in it. Uh, on a big racetrack, I think that would be an advantage. Um, you know, flattening that bar out is going to give you more straightaway traction. Uh, if you're running a lot of short racetrack stuff, you know, maybe being behind center wouldn't be the idea. Well, we've run it anywhere from four inches ahead to four inches behind. And with an open car or with a, with a modified where you can have a torque link in there, uh, there's definitely some big differences. But we've not experimented a lot with the sport mod to really tell if there was a big difference one way or the other. So uh, back on the off-season maintenance, tires. Tires should be washed and free of all dirt. It's recommended that they should be stored in black garbage bags and sealed so that there's no air can actually dry them out. Deflate the tires if they're mounted. Make sure you let the air out of them so that they can't try to grow or they can't change size over the winter. Uh, they also need to be stored in a temperature control environment because if they're not, um, tires, they get cold enough where they can actually crack. So keep that in mind. Brake system. Completely drain the brake system, including the master cylinder and the wheel cylinder. Blow out all of the brake fluid out of the lines. Brake fluids are a corrosive material. So blow that out of all the lines so the lines are all dry. Rebuild or replace your master cylinders and your wheel cylinders. Uh, honestly, the master cylinders, they're not that expensive. If you buy a kit to rebuild them, you, by the time you fiddle around rebuilding them and stuff, there's not that much difference in cost to just replace them. Um, On the brake pads, check to make sure that there's no uneven wear. If the pad is still good, deglaze them and they'll be good to go. And make sure that the caliper mounts are straight. Uh, it's, it's not out of the ordinary. Sometimes where a caliper mount, you can get hit while you're on the brakes and the cal caliper mount can be tweaked a little bit. Now, Chad's new caliper mounts are thick enough that they don't move, but uh, it's still important to check that stuff to make sure everything's straight and square. Make sure the balance bar has at least 22 rounds of movement. So clean that, take that all apart, uh, re-lube everything so that that balance bar is completely lubed with, with a good grease in there so it can move back and forth. Uh, measure your rotors for thickness and replace them if needed. Check the wheel bearings and replace them or repack them depending on, this is also a good time if you don't have the uh, low friction bearings, and if you don't have the wheel, the bearing spacers, this is a good time to upgrade to that stuff. Fuel system, very similar to the brake system. Uh, all the fuel needs to be drained out of the system. Clean all the fuel lines and fuel filter. To replace the O-rings as needed. Clean and lube all the fittings and drain the fuel from the carburetor and lube it with a, an appropriate lubrication check with your carburetor man what he wants you to actually do some guys um, run some um, oh can't think of what it's actually called now but it's kind of like a red a red lubricant that they run through their carburetor 
to make sure that they're that if you're especially if you're running alcohol definitely make sure you take care of the carburetor and i would actually recommend calling your carburetor guy and he'll tell you what he recommends you to do uh next question jerry's got a question we've got a 2016 grt sport mod what's the difference between the bhe pinot spindles and the grt pinot spindles uh, there's absolutely no difference in those spindles. Um, I don't know how GRT reams them. Um, ours are all reamed in a mill, so the reams are square and straight. Um, we have our spindles trued up so that if the spindle is not 100% straight, they'll ream it a little off to the one side. With the, the way the machine is, it, it straightens up the ream. And, that, and I don't know. I'm not saying I have no idea how GRT actually does it, but as far as I know, there's really no difference in the two spindles. Ours, I can guarantee you, are true. That is all I can say. Um, back on the uh, off-season maintenance, electrical. Here's the opportunity to thoroughly inspect all your electrical wiring, switches, and connections. Replace anything that is loose or cracked. Um, replace connections to the distributor with new ones. Uh, use a Scott a Scott Bright pad to clean all the electrical connections. Unhook all your ground connections over the winter so that no condensation can, have, can affect the grounds over the off season. Make sure the battery has a full charge in it and then store it in a climate controlled environment. Safety equipment, once again, this is the stuff that's saving your lives, guys. So we need to take good care of it too. Remove and clean the seat belts and store them in a dry, dry, content, dry temperature controlled environment. Check for any excessive wear or replace them if needed. Completely check over the seat, seat mounts for any cracks or whatever. Repair anything that's needed. Replace the protection foam if needed. And what I'm saying by the protection foam is, you know, the foam that goes on the bars above your head and, and beside your head. You know, that stuff isn't necessarily super duper high quality so it's pretty inexpensive to put new on there and start the year all fresh with some good stuff we're going to be doing uh, uh, for the rti knowledge center we're going to be doing an actual video of this type of stuff and going through that stuff here pretty soon so that's one of the things that we've been working on anything else that you'd like to add chad well, the, the rear suspension, you know, did you, I don't think you touched on the suspension cages, but, you know, you'd unhook all, unhook all the four link rods and, and put your hands on that suspension cage and spin it around and feel the bearings and, and rock it side to side and see if everything's good there. And if everything feels good, then I would just take it off the car and, and clean it up. And uh, hopefully you don't have a rusty axle tube uh, clean. This would be the time to clean that all up and, and uh, if you got to replace bearings, replace the bearings and, you know, clean that tube and then put that grease on there when you reinstall that suspension cage back on there as your, your water barrier with some thick, uh, thick wheel bearing grease in between there. Pinion seals is one we always see, it seems like, in the beginning of the year. We have so many people that, that order pinion seals because they leak, they sit all winter and, you know, if your car is not in a heated garage, that, that seal can get compromised. So... Uh, the quick change rear end uh, pinion seal would be a, another one to probably just put one in. I think they're what are they nine bucks, ten bucks, yeah, something like that. Not too expensive. You know, just like the master cylinders, these things that don't cost you a lot of money can save you a DNF when you're leading a thousand to win. You know, it's I know everything costs money, but some of these little things are the ones that eventually bite you. So maintenance is what wins races. I know you preach it in school, and and I preach it to the people that call here is. You know, you can buy the next cool gadget and think you're going to win a race, but, you know, you're getting beat by a guy that has this stuff absolutely unbelievable, bind-free, and it's just perfectly in perfect working condition is is huge, you know. So maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Well, it's been numerous times I've seen people that, that neglected their brake system over the off-season, you know, go out the next year and, and next spring, and they'll fight a month chasing a brake problem and and you know and when you think about it let's just say it costs you 200 bucks a night to race now i don't know what it costs but i'm just guessing that 
on an average, that's probably, if I want to go to the racetrack with my race car, it's going to cost me 200 bucks. Well, if I go there for four nights, that's $800 plus the amount of frustration that I would have spent and maybe what it cost me and my lack of my finishes and my, my points weren't good and blah, 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 blah. All of a sudden, these two $60 master cylinders or 65 or whatever they are, are pretty cheap in that perspective. And so it's kind of like the thing. I mean, you might not have the money today, and I understand that, but it's going to cost you tomorrow so you need to budget and, and deal with it accordingly to make sure that, you know, this is just that stuff is so frustrating and fighting an electrical problem, fighting a brake problem and, and, or a carburetion problem, fuel problem. Those three things that drive you drive you to drink, man. I mean, it just is the most frustrating parts of the race car there ever is. And normally, you know, and that can all be avoided in this off season maintenance. Did you see well, next... we're up on the eight o'clock hour? Go ahead, Chad. Did you see next question about the tight helix right rear? What's your thoughts on the, the tight helix? To be honest with you, I don't have a lot, Nick. I don't have a lot of information well, at, about that. At Super, National, at Super Nationals, I had an A mod racer that had it in. So he back to back a 225 tight helix with a a standard 225 and there's absolutely no difference i mean the tight helix thing i can see if you're traveling to get to that coil bind position where it's going to increase that rate and get progressive but if you're only getting two inches of shock travel and it's 225 pounds an inch if you're not building that rate then there's no change there so all it is is a really heavy spring at that point so it, it depends on how far you're traveling that and I don't know what kind of car you race nick but if you're just you know if you're getting minimal shock travel that's going to be the key that tight helix needs quite a bit of travel to make it do its thing. So, and I think that there's there's rumors that some of the sanctioning bodies are not going to allow that spring next year. Uh, I don't know that for fact. It's just talk. But anyway, all right, guys, another great night. We appreciate all the questions and appreciate all your input that you guys have had. And once again. Think about our 50th episode coming up, and if there's some ideas that any of you might have uh, when we do that, that, let us know, and we will uh, try to put something in place for that. We'll try to have a special night that night. So you guys have a great week, and we'll see you again December 6th, same time, same place. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.